Um, I just wanted to, while my co-worker here, Alex Wiseman, and my IT techie person <laughs> sets up the presentation, because I didn't do that earlier, it's too busy socializing. Um, I just wanted to sort of give you a little bit of background about uh, us and uh, what we do, because we do have a little booth over there, and it does clearly state Teen Health Center. However, the Windsor Essex Community Health Center has amalgamated with a bunch of different agencies in the city. Um, so we're Teen Health Center, yes, where we see teens 12 to 24. However, our um, Sandwich Community Health Center office is over on uh, College and Brock, so it's in a trailer right now. It sees all ages, as well as our uh, diabetes program over on Lozon Parkway. It sees uh, anyone with type 2 diabetes, and then um, a new program over at Pickwick Plaza across from Tecumseh Mall sees uh, at all ages as well. So um, while we're sort of talking about teens, that's sort of my forte and my background. Um, the presentation this evening is quick, and um, we're hoping to prevent opioid use and abuse among young people. However, hopefully by the end of the slides, you'll see that um, it's because sometimes it's in the hands of you. And, um, and so we want to sort of educate the community uh, in terms of where the drugs may be coming from, where the youth are accessing them, um, because it's, again, like you had just mentioned, it's a community effort that we all kind of have to become involved. Um, also with me this evening is Natalie Westfall. She's in the back, and she's a CCAC community um, uh, mental health nurse uh, with addictions. And she's in the schools, um, and so she's sort of enrolled in this program, too, in terms of really getting youth involved in talking about what they're doing and getting some help and support and so sometimes that involves all of us as community partners as well. So opioid, opioids, what are they? We hear them, we think that they're this drug that sort of mythically lives somewhere else but really what it is, it is a um, used for treating pain and it is derived from opium which is usually found in a poppy plant which really doesn't mean a whole lot to us i don't think but i think it's important to say that that comes from there because um, it seems like again it's that mythical substance that lives somewhere else but it's something that we often get prescribed by a physician so a surgeon doctor post-surgery something like that um, it goes by a, a variety of different names it can be called a narcotic it can be called an opiate it can be called an opioid and then the next slides will talk about um, what sort of their names are that we know them by, um, what the physician might call them, what the pharmacist may call them. But on the flip side, young people, and I, most of you don't look like drug users or dealers, however, these names may come across uh, your home um, when you don't even really realize that it's happening. So often the opioids or narcotics that we're familiar with and have heard from physicians and pharmacists are things like Oxycontin, Percocets, Vicodin, um, codeine, when you have Robitussin or Tylenol, any kind of cold pill, cold medicine that have codeine in them, uh, fentanyl, right? So those are medications that are often prescribed post-surgery um, for pain, severe pain, chronic pain, chronic illness. The flip side is the names that some of the street people are using. And some of those street people could be our grandchildren, they could be our nephews, they could be our neighbors, unfortunately. Um, what we're finding in our community and part of this community awareness is educating that um, it's not necessarily bad kids that are using these drugs. Um, they may be called things like uh, hillbilly heroin is well, a good one for Oxycontin. Perks is really a, a short form for Percocet. Um, the you know fentanyl, things like dance fever, China girl, China white, tango and cash. So some pretty funky names, but those are words that sometimes we need to familiarize ourselves with because they may be things that were just, oh, we might hear them and go, that's strange. What is my grandson or nephew or neighbor talking about? And this could be some of the things that they're sort of uh, referring to that you could very well have in your home that you don't really appreciate what they're talking about. The next sort of list of familiar uh, physician prescribed, pharmacy prescribed drug names are morphine, methadone, dilaudid, demerol, heroin, opium, probably not the most common. But again, those street names like smack, um, you know, uh, the dope, black stuff, big O. So things that these people are talking about um, that aren't familiar to us, but we know them as the, the drug name. So conditions that they treat. Oh. <laughs> oh. Anyways, conditions that they treat, not a blank slide. Um, they are things like, I said, chronic pain, uh, post-surgery, um, chronic disease, uh, cancer, terminally ill patients may be in a lot of pain. Physicians will prescribe pretty heavy-duty opioids to them. 
Um, oftentimes, I know I've had surgery, left the hospital with a prescription, got it filled, took one, and went, oh my gosh, this isn't for me, right? So what do I do with them? I just toss them in the cupboard. I can't take them. They make me vomit, nauseous, dizzy, can't stand up. Don't think twice about it, right? Often, we will do that. Um, but the concern is for the other people in our homes and our neighbors that might be more interested in the drugs that you have. And we'll talk about a little bit of that too. Um, so they're used for those kinds of things. They're prescribed by a physician for a reason. They're not things that you can just get off the shelf. Um, they're pretty heavy duty narcotics that are prescribed for heavy, pretty heavy duty reasons. So what's the concern? The concern for us and maybe the concern for you is that any use outside of the prescribed reason can put a person at really serious risk for things like addiction, overdose, and death. And I'm not sure, I, I could just be, because I'm really in tune with this right now, but you, if you're paying attention in the Winter Star, lots and lots and lots of articles daily about fentanyl, um, Oxycontin, all these drugs that are coming our way, these heavy duty car fentanyl that, you know, it's. Part of it's an elephant tranquilizer that's coming in from China and they're, you know, cause death. I think the most recent uh, article I read said that an interception in, in Vancouver between the Vancouver police and the Canadian Border Services found enough fentanyl to cause 750,000 overdose deaths. Um, and it comes in a package labeled office accessories. Um, and it's because China doesn't have any regulations, there's no laws against um, designing it, developing it, making it, packaging it, and selling it. So there's now a new agreement between Canada and China to try and stop this trafficking of drugs that's coming in. The sad part is, you're not getting it from your physician. These are the stuff that's coming over that's synthetic and fake and not good. The people that are ordering it are our neighbors, our kids, our grandkids, our nephews. We're seeing it in the schools, we're seeing it in our community, we're seeing it in LaSalle. Leamington, Windsor, it's not something that is existing somewhere else. It's happening right here. And the biggest concern is it's not those synthetic ones coming from China, but the real stuff is probably in your cabinet. So we'll talk about that as we go through too. So opioids are so strong that one large dose, accidentally or purposely, can be fatal. Among teens, some of these medications are being misused for reasons just to get high. Um, because they're talking and they're educating each other, they're listening to some of the things that you're saying and that their friends are saying, and they think, oh, well, you know, it's not a danger because it's a prescribed medication. Um, they're getting their hand with Oxycontin, sometimes right out of our cupboards. Tylenol 3 is pretty accessible. Tylenol 2, sometimes the doctors just give them to us because of. Um, they're smart. They know they're looking. Um, if they're getting these things from overseas, it's not regulated, so they don't know what they're getting. They might be ordering. Um, you know, the drug dealer is ordering it from China. Not every single little green pill has the same amount of fentanyl in it. Um, it they think they're getting oxycotton. It's got fentanyl. Um, you're, you know, five foot three, 104 pounds. Someone else is, you know, six foot two, 180 pounds. It's not going to affect the same person the same. Everyone's different, and not every single one of those pills has the same amount, exactly the same amount cut for each uh, pill for each person. So we could all be the same weight and height, take the same pill, have a completely different reaction. Um, fentanyl is the newest wave of drugs coming in. Recently, the carfentanil as well. Um, there's a higher rate of over overdoses. It's becoming an epidemic. Uh, the, the province of uh, British Columbia has declared an epidemic. Uh, Health Canada is involved in that as well. Um, teens, 15 to 19, the poisonings from suicide are self-inflicted. Injuries has increased 140% in the last year. Accidental poisonings, so they didn't mean to um, die, but it has increased 300% in the last year. And why is this a concern as well? Because it's happening right here in Windsor and Essex County, so there's been lots of information in the paper. Um, we were involved with, and I left articles of these two articles on the table over there. Um, so Natalie was kind enough to be interviewed and, uh, and stars in the paper as well. However, the information isn't very happy-go-lucky. Um, sadly, out of 49 counties in the province of Ontario, Essex County was number seven. We we're the seventh highest um, use of uh, opioids in the uh, province of Ontario. Um, according to a report that examines the prescriptions that are, so people that are accessing prescriptions uh, through publicly funded um, uh, monies, um, 24% of local people are using opioids. That's higher than the average for the province. And as well as overdose deaths, we're 50% higher than the rest of the province. So there's a problem, 
right here in our own community, it, it exists. And it's a little bit scarier than maybe um, some people just down the 401. So another issue for us is luckily, sort of, kind of, I guess, um, that the opioid crisis is so bad that they've now made naloxone a free um, uh, product that you can get from a pharmacy to try and prevent someone from dying. So we are encouraging young people, if they're using and they use safely, because that's part of our role as health promoters at the Teen Health Center, is uh, health promotion, disease prevention, death prevention. So if they're hanging out with friends, they're using opioids, they're not sure who the dealers are all the time, please get your hands on a, on a naloxone so that if your friend overdoses and they're turning blue, you administer the naloxone and you bring them back to life. And in there, yes, call 911, right? So again, it's scary and it's happening, um, but it's such an epidemic in Ontario, Canada, that this, this is one of the harm reduction philosophies that the government has come up with. Um, since 2013, 400% increase in opioid overdoses in Ontario alone. 90% uh, increase in overdose related hospital admissions and 160% in overdose opioid deaths and that's just in Ontario in the last year. So it is scary, it's happening. Um, yes, we're targeting sort of my philosophy and focus is on young people to try and prevent getting those drugs in their hands. It doesn't mean that people over the age of 18 and 25 and 34 and 40 and 50 aren't using because when it's prescribed, a physician does sort of a sort of a history, you know, you know, asking maybe what your addiction um, potential might be, because they don't want to give you something that's going to be harmful. However, their concern is to keep you pain free. So when they're making that uh, decision to prescribe you, they might do a health history. Um, so you may or may not know at any age whether or not you have the potential to become addicted to. So they're already kind of thinking of a plan of if I give you this and you do become, there's a weaning off process, hopefully, that they're thinking about in terms of. So um, some physicians are very good in terms of prescribing just a few post-surgery, so 10, 15, seems like a lot, but if you've got to take a couple a day for about a week because you've had... Um, back surgery or hip surgery or you're dealing with some pretty terminal uh, illnesses related with pain. Um, others, and we're seeing it with young people, 18, prime age to get their wisdom teeth out, oral surgeons giving them 30 Oxycontin for their post wisdom teeth pain. So again, frustrating and confusing and harmful on my end as this educator, but it happens. And you know what, we can point fingers and blame, but I think as a community, if we all come together and become very aware of and advocate for some of these things to happen, like don't give my son, grandson, nephew, 30 Oxycontin post-surgery for his wisdom teeth, let's just start with five, and if we need more, we'll call you. Um, talking to the pharmacist, right, about, you know what, what happens if I start to see symptoms, um, they can give you some advice on what to do. So some of the signs and symptoms, and this is for any age, um, loss of interest in appearance, the things that they used to do, their sports, their social activities, maybe they're not hanging out with their friends, um, they're not going to social groups that they used to, they're neglecting their responsibilities, their work, their school, they're skipping out of school, they're calling in sick to work. Um, things go missing in the household, cash, medications, valuables, jewelry, um, teens are swapping their Xboxes, PS4s, gaming systems for money, for drugs because they've lost interest in those things that they used to do. Um, changes in friends, they're making poor judgment, deceitful, secretive, lying behaviors, um, irregular schedules, sort of that uh, drop everything, I'm in the middle of dinner, oh, my cell phone just went off, I gotta, I'll be back in an hour, watching a movie and they're out the door because they've gotta go get something or meet someone or do something. Um, some of the other things for, again, more typically for any age, sleeping excessively at sort of rate strange atypical times of the day, um, and noticeable increase in snoring because sadly these young people have figured out that um, in order to get a quicker high for a longer period of time, they crush the narcotics and they snort them up their nose. Um, constipation, so this is something that, um, you know, they, someone might just slip out like, oh, I don't know what's going on with me, I'm just really constipated. And, my diet must have changed. They not, may not be thinking it's the narcotic that they're ingesting in their body, but that might be something to listen for. Um, slurred speech, uh, pinpoint pupils, uh, the nodding off thing. You know, they could be watching a movie, sure you're tired, but at, at dinner time, and they're kind of doing the eye thing. And those, the thing, other concern with narcotics such as this is there's no smell. It's not like alcohol or marijuana. 
is kind of, kind of a silent drug that they're taking that has these signs and symptoms. So again, even if it's something, you know, you're 45, 55, 65, the person's had surgery, be aware of, right? Are they taking it for pain or has this sort of moved into something that's a little bit more on the addictive side where you need to be concerned about maybe their health and their addiction potential? So tips for parents or grandparents was more about just this, right? This, this, the, the safety piece of it. So being aware of what's happening, who's had surgery, who's doing what, um, what does it look like, what does it sound like, what does it feel like? The other thing is to storage your, you can do the next one, it's kind of the same, the safe storage of those medications. So undoubtedly at some time in your life you may be prescribed something that's a narcotic. Um, ask the pharmacist, is this a narcotic? They may tell you. Now that you're aware of, think about that. If you hear other family members being prescribed some of these things, just be aware of there's a potential for other people to get their hands on it. Because what we want to do is make sure that these drugs don't, in, don't get into the hands of the wrong people. Right? And that could be your neighbor, your friend, your niece, your grandson, your granddaughter, something like that. Um, so getting rid of any unused. So again, if you've taken the medication, it's not really sitting well with you. I'm not a really good, I can't take Tylenol-3s or stuff like that for pain. If I have it, don't flush it because that's not good for the water system either. Bring it back to the pharmacy. I know that tonight we're talking about um, Zeter Pharmacy is here and collecting. Um, old, unused, used, not used, don't want any more drugs, expired drugs, get rid of them because if they get into the wrong hands of the wrong people, they could be detrimental as well. Bring them back to your pharmacy. If you're not sure, make a phone call. Um, make arrangements just to get them out of your house. If you have to have them in your house because um, you need them now or certain times, lock them up, put them somewhere where um, they're not accessible um, so people don't know. And the other thing is don't talk about the medications that you have in your house. Um, we had this conversation at a, um, with another person from our committee and it was sort of like someone sort of innocently, uh, say an elderly person at Tim Hortons with a group of their friends talking about, you know, someone had surgery, they were prescribed these narcotics and it made them really loopy and they couldn't take them, they were in fear of falling, they didn't, you know, the drugs weren't sitting well, so they had these medications in their home. Well, you don't know who's sitting at the table next to you or across from them or down a little ways because these people and these young people that are interested in accessing these drugs are listening for your conversations. You're putting yourself at risk for um, them finding out who you are and, and befriending you and next thing you know you're in your house using your bathroom um, or your house getting broken into because they know that there's a surplus of drugs that are sitting somewhere in your house, your cabinet, bathroom, cabinet, kitchen cabinet, wherever you keep them. So again, keep them stored away, get rid of them if you don't need them, don't talk about what you have in your house. And that's true with just a surplus of cough medicine with codeine in it because sometimes people get so desperate, that's what they turn to, turn to just to get that high because they're chasing the high. They're not there to really to intentionally hurt you, they want to get high. So the do's and don'ts of safe storage Again, ask your pharmacist, um, does it have potential for abuse? Know your, your family, know what's going on. Maybe you know people that shouldn't be maybe taking them. Let them have one or two, then get rid of them. Switch to just good old Advil, Tylenol if you can. Lock them up if you have to, um, somewhere out of state, out of uh, you know, reach for young people as well. Um, keep them in their original container because if something does happen and they do get abused, then you want to know what that person took. Um, keep an updated list of all your medications that you have in the house, but keep that tucked away somewhere. Um, talk to your pharmacist again about how to properly dispose of them. Um, don't leave them in a place that's likely accessible. For children or pets or your visitors, they're going to come over because there are probably people looking through your bathroom cabinets, um, whether we like to think that they are or not. Um, store them, don't store them in a cabinet where there's humidity temperature change because it changes the medication so it might not do what it's supposed to do, that's just for our own use for anything. Um, don't share medications because sometimes we think, oh well, it's prescribed for pain and I, you got a migraine, here you go. Um, so we don't want to be sharing and giving out uh, uh, medications that don't belong to other people because you really don't know how they're going to react either. Um, and then don't take medications in front of young people or people that, because they're just influence, right? It makes it look easy, I'll just take this, I'll feel much better. Um, you know, mommy's always popping Advil every Saturday morning at 8 a.m., I don't know why, but she makes, all of a sudden she feels better. So we sort of look like we're setting little habits for young people um, where they just turn to medications for the answer for a relief of pain, right? So we want to kind of get away from that as well. 
At home drug tests, there's plenty of plenty available. Um, this might not be relevant for this evening. However, if you're concerned or want to, these are accessible um, online. Um, you can't really buy them in the pharmacy, but you can order them online. Um, places like the Teen Health Center, if you were concerned and wanted to bring someone to get a drug test, you could do that. You'd have to call ahead. Um, teen Health Center, we see teens 12 to 24, but I'm sure um, other places like our sandwich office or our diabetes office or something. If not, if we can't do it, we'll certainly direct you to the right place that can. Um, again, they are accessible to order online. They're relatively cheap. They come shipped within a few days. Um, Amazon, testcountry.com, drugtestkits.ca, those are all Canadian. Um, and they'll ship to Canada usually for free. And if you buy them in bulk, they're relatively cheaper. And the benefits of doing that, it's inexpensive. Um, you get some reliable results. Um, you can simultaneously screen for more than one drug. So uh, I know the ones that we have at Teen Health Center, it's all the ones that we listed, plus some. So the marijuana and some um, other drugs that they may be not realizing that they're taking, or it's mixed in with something. They think they're smoking pot, but then it's laced with something else, so it would show up on a drug test as well. And again, that's for our own education. We're trying to prevent someone from getting into some trouble or further down the line. So we want to be able to say to them, like, you thought you only smoked pot. However, this, this, and this is showing up in your drug test. So where are you buying it from? Make some safe choices. Let's think about quitting, harm reduction, those kinds of things. Get some help and support, too. And then there's a whole host of other places that you can go to or recommend people. If they become addicted, you've seen the signs and symptoms, you've talked to them, they need some help and support. Teen Health Center, yes, is a great place. So is Sandwich. There's lots of other places in the community that can go for counseling. And support, parent support groups. We have lots of parents come and talk to counselors because their son, daughter, grandson, whoever, you know, you need help and support too. If it's not you, sometimes we need to know what to do with this person that's living in my home or that I'm related to or that I love dearly. There's also a whole uh, host of actual methadone and suboxone clinics that um, people can go to to help get off of the medication. So if they become addicted to a, uh, a narcotic, um, they will kind of coach them through in terms of counseling as well as the suboxone and the, me and the methadone or medications that they take that help with the withdrawal symptoms so that they're not going through a, an ugly withdrawal so that they want to turn back to taking the drug. So those are just um, some places that are available. Um, you know, you can certainly call anywhere, Health Unit, Teen Health Center, and we can tell you places that uh, you can refer people to. And I think, is that it? Um, additional resources in terms of places to go for support, some of them are residential. Um, so Brentwood has a software scene for, for women. Um, the Windsor Regional Hospital Addiction Assessment Referral um, will do an assessment and then also refer for uh, withdrawal management as well. If you had any medical questions, Natalie would be your girl <laughs> to ask. I'm just a health promoter that does the presentations and sort of pretends I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but she's the person to ask the more medical stuff if you had anything. So if there's not anything, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and really what we just want to do is to create that awareness so that you know, keep an eye out, what's in your cupboards, um, what are some people doing, saying around you, if you have stuff, take it back to the police department, take it back to the pharmacy, shoppers, Rexall, whichever one, you, those private ones, um, deal with, um, if you had any questions, you could certainly ask those people as well. Okay. So thank you.